Center. My name is Bernice Lewis, and I'm thrilled to be here uh, to moderate a panel called Eves in Music. Uh, I've been a research associate of music here at Williams College for 16 years and had the wonderful privilege of being invited to teach a course on songwriting and performing that's been uh, offered every winter study for 16 years, and um, it's been one of the highlights of my year. So uh, in addition to that, the rest of the time I spend my life touring around the country playing music and um, teaching in other places. I'm not going to waste a lot of your time talking about me, but what I'd like to do is play a song for you. I'm going to bring up one of my former students, Mr. Oyan Makuchi, and uh, we'll play one of mine. I know he's wonderful, isn't he? And then I'll bring on some wonderful guests. introduce the first guests. Um, you know, uh, everybody sent me a bio except Dave and Oyon because I've known them for so long they figured that I could make things up. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. I had the privilege of having both of them in class and watching them form this amazing band called Darling Side and name it after a Hemingway quote that I use in class a lot uh, for writers, that you have to kill your little darlings. And I had all five of them, and I, I know you're going to enjoy them. They're performing tonight as a group, but right now we have two of them. So come on up, and I'll embarrass you. Um, you already heard Oyan Mukherjee play. Oyan Mukherjee is the glue that holds any situation together that I've ever been involved with with him. He, uh, when he graduated from Williams, he got a Watson Award, and he used it to 
travel around to Brazil and Turkey and Ireland and learn how to play stringed instruments. And uh, Dave Semft, um, I had this whole formal thing I was going to say about him, but this is what they told me I should say because it's true. Uh, I never had a student who gave me as much trouble as he did. Uh, and then wrote me love notes on graduation weekend. So he's a brilliant and talented songwriter, one of my favorite vocalists. How about a hand for Oyan Mukherjee and Dave Sent, also known as Darling Side. Two fifths. Oh, hello. Check, hey. Check, check. So we are. Oh, I was going to just. Uh... <laughs> Is that all right? I sound checked without this, but. So we are two fifths of Darling Side, and uh, we're going to play a song from Darling Side's new, uh, well, upcoming album. It's coming out this July, and uh, the song is called The Ancestor. If I had just gotten the next artist's bio in the mail, I would have a real hard time introducing her because I think she's pretty much the queen of the understatement. Um, I first was aware of Chris Delmhorst's work long before I knew she had any affiliation with Williams. In fact, uh, I remember getting up one morning at a place where we were both crashing after a gig, and she kind of casually mentioned that she came to school here. Do you remember that? 
and you've lost both contact lenses that morning. Yeah, I remember it. Um, but she, she came out to, every, every year I get to bring a, a visiting guest artist to my class, and Chris came a couple years ago. And people give me all kinds of CDs. I have stacks and stacks of them at home. I try to listen to them all, but every once in a while something catches me, and then I don't listen to anything but that for six months to a year. And that's what happened to me with one of her albums called Songs for a Hurricane. My daughter, who was then, I think, five, and I would just listen to it in the car on back to back, back to back, back to back. So um, a few things from her bio. Uh, she made two albums with Morphine's Billy Conway. Um, she's just releasing a album of covers of Cars songs called Cars. That would be The Cars. That's got to be really good. Um, that she made in a studio this time. She also did the Bonnie Vera approach a few years ago. And uh, she is married to a fellow singer-songwriter named Jeffrey, F I, I never get his full call, and they have a lovely daughter. She lives near here in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Please welcome Chris Del Morris. Never seen this place before. It's very fancy. I had a plan, but now I changed it just in the last two minutes. I'm going to play a different song than what I was going to play. That doesn't actually affect you, really, I guess, at all, but. Unless it turns out that I can't play it that good, then. This is a newer one. It's sort of a, uh, it's funny to be here, you know, I just rolled in this afternoon. And this is a song uh, that's, I wrote recently, but it's sort of a backwards looking, thinking about the past kind of song. So, go with this one. on 92nd Street, one of seven million faces, maps inside your jacket sleeves, keys to all the secret places. i 
using all the longest words, singing all the way to bleaker, sweetest sounds I ever heard, coming through a broken speech. So um, I'm just getting to know the next two artists. I'm going to bring them up together and tell you about Eric Kay first because he's going to perform one of his pieces and uh, Abby Dobson's going to help him and then I'm going to come back and tell you about Abby just because they both have these long resumes and I don't want her to get shortchanged. Um, Eric's was the longest bio I've gotten and uh, I, when I tried to pick out highlights, he just added some more. He's done pretty much everything. Um, he lives in New York, and he's the executive creative director and partner of The Lodge, a music production company with offices in New York and Los Angeles. He just uh, finished scoring a film called Chasing Shakespeare, starring Danny Glover. Chasing Shakespeare, that's a bit of a mouthful. And that's going to come out this fall. And also recording a new record with uh, a band called the Mickey Finns, and the record's called The Prayers and Idle Chatter. So in addition to all of that, he's a songwriter. He's uh, written music for hundreds, literally hundreds of commercials, uh, producer, musician, and a third generation professional musician. Um, how about a hand for Eric Kay? Thanks. Uh, the one thing I don't do is sing, so thankfully Abby is right here to do that for me. Um, and this song was one of those hundreds and hundreds of commercials that never saw the light of day. It was, we were approached to write a new theme for cotton to touch the feel. They were bored with the fabric of our lives, so they said, give us some new songs that you know, can be an instant classic. And they heard it and said, okay, we're going to keep the fabric of our lives, but thank you. So this is the first time this has been heard by anybody other than the cotton people. Thank you, Abby. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Your big eyes watching me As I'm wondering what to wear A mini skirt or tight jeans So hot it's not fair Living in my prime You're quickly learning I'm an angel and a vixen Changing all the time I'm gonna be who I am So catch me if you can I'm the wind beneath your hair I'm your game of truth or dare I'm your hopes, I'm your dreams I'm your curious schemes It don't bother me when they all stop and stare Nothing compares All dressed up We're downtown No place that I'd rather be Strut my stuff Cause I'm proud To be a woman like me Now I'm gonna ride at my own I'm a changing face, living in my pride. You're quickly learning I'm an angel and a vixen, changing all the time. I'm gonna be who I am, so catch me if I can. I'm the wind beneath your hair, I'm your game of truth or dare. I'm your hopes, I'm your dreams, I'm your curious schemes. It don't bother me.
So since you just heard Abby sing, I don't have to describe her voice for you, although there's all these great adjectives about it. Uh, passionate, defiant of, car of uh, category, all natural, original. But you could tell, right? So uh, here's some of the great places she's performed in New York. Uh, SOBs, The Knitting Factory, The Cutting Room, Joe's Pub, The Blue Note, all really great places to perform. Uh, she was featured three times as a singer-songwriter at the New York Songwriters Circle, a finalist in the R&B category of the John Lennon Songwriting Competition for her song, Deeply, which was featured on uh, three TV shows um, and a BMI Atlanta Urban Music Showcase uh, winner. I got it all right. That's a lot of accolades. How about a hand for Abby Dobson? here um, and I'm so excited that Eric could join me. Um, he's an amazing uh, musician and I've actually worked at the lodge. Um, so you know they keep it keep it family. Um, <laughs> this song is called Unconditionally and it's one of my favorites. I could um, wake up and always want to sing it. It's about unconditional love. It's about finding that person um, or being that person who loves someone in spite of any obstacle, um, any adversity. Um, you know, any quirks, whatever, unconditionally. He'll be 
Abby Dobson, we're going to bring everybody back out and talk a little bit about uh, being an alum, Hanif, and music. So uh, come on out. most obvious question, the one everybody wants to know the answer to is, you know, was music like an important part of your Williams experience? Uh, how did it translate to having a, a career in music, things like that? Um, maybe we should start with you guys, with the Darling Side Boys, because I know Williams was a huge part of your, music was a huge part of your experience here, and also of like what's going on for Darling Side now, and then we can pass it around, yeah? So uh, yeah, w music, Williams, those two things are very close in my mind. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really like my freshman year roommate that much uh, when we first is met. That, is that true? Yeah, it was, it was pretty true. Um, <laughs> and now uh, he's a business partner, a friend, among other things. And uh, yeah, Dave, so we, we, it, was, it was a strange four year experience and then it ended up with us sort of. Uh, you couldn't get enough. Yeah, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's where I'm still at. Yeah. Um, and the uh, the other guys in the band, like uh, our drummer Sam, uh, I was his JA, so I like to, to point that out frequently when uh, he's sort of correcting me doing things, that I was once a, a great mentor to him, <laughs> uh, which he may or may not agree with. And uh, then the remaining two guys, Harris Pasteltiner and Don Mitchell, were both uh, in the octet with um, Dave and myself. So uh, we it's just one big incestuous Williams party all the time in, our, <laughs> in the band. Yeah, they didn't want to graduate. We've also... Yeah, that, uh, we're having a pretty good time now. It's been mm -hmm. good. Um, we uh, we also have received a, a massive amount of support from Williams alumni, both like uh, coming out to shows and supporting us when we when we were out playing, and uh, the alumni network even more broadly. Like, had, had someone suggested that music would have been like that, that that as a musician we'd be able to tap into that, I, I would not. I, I mean, I didn't know anything about the alumni network at all as a student, um, but uh, I wouldn't have believed them anyway because that's how stubborn I was. But uh, the uh, 
it's been unbelievable. We've just, like, even folks who are in different generations who uh, have just get excited about the fact that they're, they're um, folks who are out there trying to pursue the arts, and uh, we've, we've just been incredibly lucky. So we, have, uh, we owe a great deal to, uh, to Williams and the community, both in our formation and uh, our, our career tra trajectory, trajectory since then. <laughs> so like four syllables was really hard. <laughs> but notice that Dave isn't saying anything. That's because I'm holding the mic. <laughs> I would agree <laughs> with everything that was said. Um, I, had a, I had a unique, uh, probably, experience with music uh, because I, I started being a musician at Williams. I think probably the arc goes the other way for a lot of people. Um, uh, oh, yeah, that was bad, wasn't it? Um, so Williams was incredible for me in, in, in fostering something that was sort of only a, an interest prior to that. And I, I came in thinking I was going to be a, a math math major, well, I was a math major, but thinking, <laughs> thinking I was going to be a math guy, and I'm very much no longer a math guy, but um, I would agree with Wine that, that what Williams has done since, since graduating has been, you know, unbelievable. It, it, we're, we're constantly just in awe of what this community is capable of, of doing in terms of supporting their own. It's, it's been, I mean, we absolutely 100% would not be able to do what we're doing now without, without this community behind us. Okay, then. <laughs> top that. <laughs> Go ahead, Abby. <laughs> um, not trying to top that. just want to say um, what you listen to and what you do musically um, early on, especially in your teen years and your early 20s. Uh, now this is my uh, 20th year anniversary. <laughs> so uh, that's really important. And um, when I was here at Williams, I sang a lot. And um, it was indispensable, just um, just so important to my craft. So I, w I would say Williams helped me to develop my craft, um, helped me to develop technique. Um, I, and I sang a lot in the gospel choir, and I sang a lot um, as a student of someone who I'm so happy is in the, the room tonight or t this afternoon. So I really want to acknowledge my vocal teacher, my voice teacher, all four years that I was here at Williams. Ms. Elizabeth Suderberg is, is here, and I just want to thank her so much for all of the technique and all of the tips that you gave me um, for four years and for putting up with me for four years. <laughs> well, Chris, you were, I know you were, you were an art major here. I was. Yeah, and, but you... Well, I, I mean, it's, I have almost an opposite kind of um, story because I, didn't, I, started, I was a musician before I got here. I played cello growing up. and um, So I played in the Berkshire Symphony, and I, I did some chamber stuff here, but I was kind of ending that chapter of my life as a musician. And um, I majored in studio art. Um, so there's no direct line. I didn't start singing or playing guitar or any of that until after I left uh, Williams. But um, being in the studio art program, and especially being a part of the community of art majors in the in the studio buildings. And I was a photography um, student primarily. So the, the community in the darkroom and in the studios, uh, I think is probably the thing that helps me now most directly, the experience of having been a part of that, a supportive but critical group of, of fellow creators. And so now as a writer, I feel like that, um, I still use things that I learned here in terms of writing and keeping balancing the perspective between uh, subjective and objective views of, of the piece that I'm working on and that kind of stuff. So even though it's a totally different medium, I feel like the um, just being a member of a community of artists, this was the first time I really had a, a great experience like that, and that's something that I've taken with me other places. And, hmm. So... I wasn't going to be a musician either. But you were a music major, according I, to you. Yeah, but I wasn't going to be. I was playing in bands, and I thought, yeah, you know, but I'll be a math major because, you know, that's real. And then I thought, <laughs> you know, maybe I can do both. So I was going to be a double major. And then second semester, senior year came, and there were two more math classes. And I said, I don't want to be a math. I already got a job lined up. So I'll major in music, but I'm going to work for Anderson Consulting and have a real job. And then after a year of that, I'm like, I can't fight it. Um, and while I was at Williams, another classmate of mine, D.W. Mays, his senior thesis was to make a short film. So I said, hey, I'll write the music. So I did that, and 
turned out his mother was an advertising producer, and she introduced me to someone who I got my foot in the door and started doing that for years. So that was directly due to Williams. And then after a few years of commercials, I decided I wanted to try TV. So I started, you know, I opened up the alumni directory and said, who was there? And uh, the first guy that wrote back was Hedrick Smith from 55. And he said, sure, you can score my next film or TV show. And I ended up having a nice 14-year partnership scoring about a dozen of his frontline shows and PBS programs and it's been wonderful. Um, so Williams has definitely helped me. <laughs> no doubt. I'm starting to feel like I failed the cash in a little bit. <laughs> work hard. So it might not be too late, Chris. <laughs> I guess not. Yeah, I mean, that was going to lead me to my next question, you know, which is where are you today? So maybe you can start, because you're doing all kinds of things, Eric. I mean, what do you, your resume is, or your resume is a bad word for musicians. You're, so, okay. doing a, all you, kinds yours is kind of like a resume, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> like she said, I just finished scoring a film um, that's going to be out in September with Danny Glover. Um, and then July 17th, an album that I produced and play with, which is an Irish rock band, which is completely different than anything else you've heard, but a lot of fun. Um, and then lots of commercials and TV shows and just making music all day long. That's pretty good. It is pretty fun. Yeah. Abby, you want to talk about what you're up to these days? Um, I just started a new day job. Um, the realities of working as a musician is a lot of times you have to um, eat <laughs> <laughs> um, by having a standard job. Um, luckily for me, I graduated from Williams and I went to uh, Georgetown Law School and so I had a legal background, but then decided I didn't want to pursue that. Um, so I work as a paralegal during the day, and I sing, you know, everywhere around that. Um, working on a second album, I put out a first album in 2010, and just, you know, singing around town. I've sung at some really great places, and um, as I get older, it's just important for me to, to continue to include music or keep music as an important part of my life and to let go of, um, you know, sort of outside standards of what it means to succeed um, as an artist. I think as long as I am creating and enjoying what I create, um, that I'm doing what God put me to do here, which is, which is to uh, uplift. And part of, my, part of the way I do that is by, by singing. Hmm. Well, I know I got carried away introducing you guys and forgot to mention a few things, but you just were up, you, did you win a Boston Music Award or some, oh, something? In, I mean, you just moved to Boston six months ago, right? We did. We, I th we were voted in the first annual New England Music Awards, the best band in Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> You can talk. Yeah. And then you could talk about other things you're doing, just to use up a little time, Dave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is very short. Um, so, hey, hey. <laughs> Did I mention that Oyan's kind of the glue? <laughs> I like to think of myself as a mother figure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here, let me do that for you. Mother what? I'm a year older. Um, so we're a full-time band at the moment, which is why we're looking forward to all the free, all-you-can-eat meals this weekend. Um, and uh, we have an album coming out uh, in July, which we've been working very hard on. Um, and I think what sort of that means for us, aside from actually having a product, which is going to be incredible, um, and it's been almost a year in the making, is we've, you know, one of the Williams things is you learn how to do everything, and we've all kind of taken to the administrative business side of music partially because of necessity but also partially due to inclination because we like that kind of stuff um, and I think it's been a great time we've all enjoyed it but we're we're really excited to get back to writing music and it's been a long time since we've I think almost a year since I've sat down and like worked on some lyrics because we we essentially just totally went gung-ho on the business side of things and it was and it was great and everyone sort of sort of saying to us though, like, but, but you guys, like, you're musicians, like, you should be writing music. Oh and, and so we're starting to get excited for that because that's sort of what's up next, is basically touring the album and, and then mm. getting back to work, writing some, some new stuff. Really? Okay. Chris, you want to talk about what you're up to? Yeah. Um, 
I'm sort of doing what I do. I, I have been full-time musician since uh, probably about 98 or 99, and um, that's when my first album came out, and I've, there's been a slew of them since then, I don't know, seven or eight, something like that. And um, so I tour around the country and around Europe a little bit and play shows by myself or with a band, depending upon how much they're paying me. And um, in the last four, I have a daughter who's almost four, so I've been uh, staying home a little bit more than I ever did before, which has been really nice. Um, but I'm finishing up songs for a new album and hoping to get in the studio in the fall. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's I've had a couple of songs that were in TV shows. I'm hoping that happens more because mm. of the eating thing. <laughs> And yeah, it's a great, it's not exactly, um, I had absolutely no idea I was going to end up doing this when I was here at Williams, so it's interesting uh, mm. to be back and have this whole another chapter have happened, but I feel lucky. Speaking of eating, I was, I was thinking about, um, you know, asking you each, uh, like, about the obstacles, you know, I know you brought it up first, Abby, but being a full-time musician, I've been a full-time musician for 30 years, and it's amazing how little time I get to spend writing and so I thought I'd maybe let you guys weigh in on that. I know you, you've already talked about it a little bit, how much, how much goes into it that's behind the scenes. Everybody thinks it's a pretty glamorous life, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Go ahead, we could, you, you're nodding. Me? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. Me, yeah. You're changing diapers, right? Uh, well, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. But, right. No, there's a lot. I mean, even besides the demands of the rest of your life, whatever it is, <sighs> being a mom and, and whatever else it is, just being... Uh, a touring musician, it's sort of an old joke that everybody says, but the what you get paid to do is really like drive around and do email. You know, I feel like that's my job. And then actually getting to stand on stage and play music is is sort of one of the perks of the whole thing. But your actual occupation is sort of is all this behind the scenes um, business and logistics, endless, endless logistics that uh, never stop. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you guys know. It seems like, like to, it's more uh, more so even with the internet. Sorry, Dave. I was just gonna say I, I often feel like our real profession is being retail T-shirt sales <laughs> yeah, right. people. Merch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, retail clothing. Yeah. <laughs> Tweeting. I can't see you guys on the end, so you're gonna have to. You pretty much have to be your own publicist, your own manager, your own you know best salesperson. Um, the life of the artist now is not one where people protect you necessarily. You really have to be involved in every, in everything um, at every level, whether it's you know um, a singer songwriter singer songwriter just starting out, or even you know someone like um, a Lady Gaga, let's say. Um, she's her best publicist, really. So you have to take on a lot, and so I really feel what you're saying in terms of not having as much time to devote to, to the craft of songwriting. And writing, and we live in a culture now where um, it's really so not about that. Um, and so you're competing with people who um, aren't necessarily spending any time doing that. Um, so it's difficult. But you know, we do it for the love. Um, that's why I do it. So, notwithstanding the obstacles, you know, I just sing. Whether it's in my living room with my hairbrush, like I did when I was on at Williams B, um, <laughs> or or not. <laughs> You got it. You got any obstacles, Eric? Um, well, or is it all good? No, I had a I have a different skill set. You know, a lot of my time is not spent driving around and you know booking gigs. But um, the old days, you could sit and write music at a piano, and then that would be it. Now you have to write it, you have to play all the instruments at once, and then you have to engineer it, mix it, record it, produce it, um, you know, and then do sales at the same time. So. You have to pretty much be everything at once because the barriers to entry have greatly changed. When I first set up my own studio in 97, it was about $100,000 startup cost. And I just moved to a new house and set the same studio up for $10,000. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier to get into the business now. But you have to know a lot more. You yeah. have to know how to run that studio. Yeah, all by yourself. <laughs> there's no more engineers. There's no studio musicians. There's no, you're, you're doing it all. Yeah. I'm wondering if anybody out there has questions for these guys. Are they here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know that they are. Oh, I'm not. 
Raise your hand if you are. Busy <laughs> tire. I got a lot of support in some ways, um, which was in sort of, there were five music majors in my year, and we each got our own grand piano and an hour a week with the chair of the department. And, you know, that doesn't happen too many other places. And at least for the composers and the tutorial system, 20% of my classes at Williams were two students or less. You know, it was me, another composer, and, you know, the head of the music department, which was amazing. Uh, very little of that was practical, real-world knowledge on how to write music for a living. You know, it was wonderful theoretical knowledge and learning your history, and all that's vital to have in your background, but in terms of real-world job preparation, it's very little. You want to answer the questions? Do yeah. Have uh, to, I mean, yeah. We weren't, and, and you took some, minimal. yeah, a little bit. I was just, we, 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 thank you. We had minimal interaction. I at least had very minimal interaction with the music department at, because I was not a music major. Um, and I didn't actually take very many music classes. And uh, we were not that, I, I was not that active as a musician uh, on campus other than in the a cappella group that uh, which uh, to, to the extent that the acapella scene sort of counts as part of the music scene on, on campus, that was unbelievable for, for just getting so many kids. I mean, we have, you know, seven groups or hat did when I was here and um, which is a lot, you know, per student and, and the, the energy of, of people being supportive for their friends and going out to those shows and, and um, you know, just like three, four shows a semester, and people would just mm -hmm. go every time, and it was very, very good for people who, like me, were sort of just figuring out that I even liked to sing, and, and, um, and that was totally, I mean, that was, that's a huge part of why I'm doing music now. I find that um, my classes are full of kids from a cappella groups, but not necessarily music majors. Yeah. Abby, were you going to say something? Yeah, I didn't major in music here, but um, I took voice lessons as part of the music department, and I did that all through my time here from a freshman to senior. And I don't know if that was so much the music department as my teacher, um, <laughs> my voice teacher, uh, who was very supportive. Um, and I think also, the music department supports other organizations. I know they were very supportive of the gospel choir, which I was a very big part of as well. So um, the music department had a lot to do with my experience at Williams, even though I wasn't a formal music major. Anybody else have any questions? I would say you should do whatever you want while you're in school and know that when you get out, you can still do whatever you want. Uh, that, that was, not, that was uh, not made clear to me. I mean, it's not, not no one's fault, just my ignorance. But uh, I, I like to pin things on other people. Um, I came in to Williams thinking I would do major in things like physics and then ended up going pre-med. And, uh, and then, as Bernice mentioned, I, I ended up doing a fellowship where I was... Uh, studying mandolin and other small strings things um, around the globe. And that was sort of the first time that I'd been outside of a world where it was like college prep high school and then Williams where you get a professional degree and do something. But um, this fellowship was a great intersection of prestigious enough that my parents were comfortable allowing me to do so and I was comfortable doing so and meeting people who were completely outside of uh, professional anything. Um, like my friends and uh, yeah, just, you're living on not necessarily the, the, the ideal amount of funds over the course of this fellowship, so I was hanging with some shady characters, and it was great. It was good. Uh, I learned a lot from them. Um, but I didn't realize that you could, you could just, like, move to Rio and try to teach English and maybe learn Portuguese while you're there. Like, that's something you're allowed to do, and then you can come back and do whatever you want still. And when you have, when you have a Williams degree, that means, I mean, and not only you, you maybe learn something while you were here, but you also have this network of alumni who, who want to help you out no matter what's going on. So... Uh, you, ha you have an incredible safety net, and, and that's, that's something that, that one shouldn't take for granted, I think. So, like, it, it's uh, every time I'm talking to a, a senior or junior who's, who's waffling about doing this or that and maybe getting, um, you know, a consulting job or something where they're, they're not necessarily as excited about it, but it's something that they can at least sort of, um, you know, bite down on and, and, and not worry, um, I encourage them to just do whatever they want. And, and like if you, can, you, can, you can move to, to France and learn how to make pastries for a year, and then you can come back and do consulting, and it's fine. But you're, you're allowed to do these things, and, and uh, I, I just wasn't aware of it, so I try to spread that love as much as possible. <laughs> oh 
Especially because there's no, there's not like a, there's not pre-med of what we do. Like there's no, there is no real preparation for this except kind of gathering as many skills as you can. Because like you were saying, there's, you know, there's the creative side and the business side and the sort of social side and all these things. So if you can just kind of gather as much into your toolbox as you can and then just go out there and make it up as you go along. But if Williams has a class on like retail clothing, <laughs> that would selling, be really helpful. That would be good. <laughs> New major, maybe, yeah. T-shirt display set up. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> this is for Eric. Oh, gosh. That's a tough one. I don't know. I mean, all the great musicians. How about Beethoven? <laughs> <laughs> There, there are a lot of young bands right now who are doing some really exciting stuff with uh, different ways of releasing their music, different ways of, of interacting with their fans. Um, as, as far as specifics, uh, it's, it's, I mean, there are a few examples. Uh, Radiohead releasing an album where they don't try, like, just pay what you want. Um, it's just was, was a really exciting thing, uh, and that, that was just a few years ago. And, and uh, there are a lot of folks now who are, who are uh, there's, there's a band called The Weeknd that I think gives their, all their albums away for free, and, and uh, they're, they're sort of making their money on, on live shows and, and getting folks out to, the, to, to watch them tour. And um, I, I realize I'm not answering questions that I'm naming a specific act that's doing one thing, but we're certainly like, it's a very exciting time for us to be in the music industry, I feel like, as a young band, just because there's the whole, uh, the way folks are releasing music, the way folks are playing shows, and the way folks are interacting with their fans is completely changing. So we've we've sort of we're still figuring out exactly how we want to do it. And and everyone there there there's a lot of there are a lot of fun experiments to watch as far as how these other bands are are putting things together. Mm -hmm. So we we are watching it, but there's not uh, as far as Darling said, there's not one band that we're trying to emulate. It's sort of using uh, watching the way that they're experimenting and, and putting together our own path from from that. So I thought we could finish up if you could just each maybe say one thing about what the most satisfying thing about what you do for a living is or what you're doing with your music, just real quick, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, I know you must do more collaborating now, too, with I do, being well, in house with another songwriter. Yeah. We mm. don't write together, but mm. we um, edit mm -hmm. each other. <laughs> A lot. Um, that would be useful. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little too useful. Uh, yeah, I bet. I think just having a having work that I feel connected to and that feels connected to other people is, you know, it's that's a pretty that's sort of basic thing to say, but uh, it's I feel very fortunate to have that because there's a lot of ways to put food on the table, but it's great to feel something that that feels like it actually comes from inside me in some way and. Uh, that's probably the best thing. Yeah. Definitely just getting to do what I love with, with four of my best friends is like, I, I know that's sort of every college kid's dream is that when you move out, you're going to keep living with your best friends and keep, you know, and for the last five years, it's, it, we don't all still live together literally in the same house, but essentially we spend all our time together and it's, it, it, there are ups and downs certainly, but it's, it, it's totally the dream that, that you think about when you're growing up of doing something fun with a bunch of guys that or girls or whoever that you're that, that you want to spend time with and, and not just people who happen to be at your office you know um, and that's been incredible hmm. singing is still one of my favorite things to do the actual act of you know sitting down or standing and singing a song with a particular lyric that you have a connection to and um, to get to do that um, whether it's presenting it for an audience or for myself or for my family is still one of the greatest um, things for me. On top of that, um, sort of re-shifting my idea of what the dream of a life in music means is also where I'm at and I'm being delighted by it as well to know that dreams change and that's, and that's fine and you can be as excited about something that changes um, from a childhood uh, dream and the opportunity to, to create music with a concept, which is what I'm excited about, with a particular point of view. And it's not just about, you know, getting up and just being sort of like a singer, singer girl. 
but having an idea, a point of view that you wish to put out into the world. And as an artist, getting back to another question, it's hard for me to think of who I necessarily emulate that's out there right now, but the type of artists or artists that gave of their craft, excellent musicians, artists, and also had something to say that was relevant to the time, to the world that we live in, um, something beyond just singing and, and dancing. I think for me, the most satisfying thing is uh, at the end, just having a product that you've created and looking back and being in the process is great, but a lot of it is drudgery, spending 12 hours a day over a piano. And then at the end of it, you can say, that's, you know, that's my music on TV or this is my record. And that's the real satisfying part to me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, thanks. Thanks you to all of you for coming. Thanks to alumni for putting this together. Um, I just want to say two things uh, to finish up. One is that uh, I know some, some of us have CDs. I don't think they've gotten put up in the lobby, but we'll be hanging out. So if you're interested in any of their mu anyone's music, just accost us <laughs> immediately. And then also, um, Darling Side is playing tonight, uh, all of them, all five of them at Goodrich at 9 p.m. And I recommend uh, you, uh, you come and see that. It'll, it might be a little loud. Probably will be high energy, but it's always really good. And uh, well, yeah, and also uh, the couple of guys from '82 right there have roped me into playing with their band excellent. tonight in the '92 quad and tomorrow night in the '82 quad. So so there's all kinds of music. The, '92, '82, '62. What's the band called? E F U. <laughs> no, is it really? They can show the show. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you guys for having us.